because like we talked earlier, you know, one of the first jobs is to sense this movement in, in where you are in space and time and how much the load is on the body. So, but it can't do that until they've been pressurized in a sense, you know? Mm. So, so once the calf today thing hits your pressure, now you pull this bar, it knows exactly what's going on, which means you could do this slow pull because the feet are telling you where you are versus the hands telling you what's going on. Those, that becomes the difference is, is relying on sensory information from the hands to lift or relying on sensory information from the foot to lift. And that becomes the, the, the biggest difference. And then what do people say? Improve your grip strength. Yeah, of course improve your grip strength. Your feet are not telling you anything. That was coach, movement expert, and innovator Adarian Barr. And you're listening to the Just Fly Performance Podcast. It's awesome to have you guys here. Thanks for being on this journey of learning with me. And I always look forward to releasing these podcasts with Adarian. Adarian has coached throughout the country in track and field. He is a mentor and an educator to a great many coaches who are hungry for getting outside the box and learning more about the human body and movement and joints and this intersection of physics and human movement in a new way. If I had to describe Adarian in the simplest terms, it would just be that he sees more things than we do. <laughs> Adarian sees so many layers and nuances to human movement, and it has been such a tremendous impact in my own coaching. When I first met him, I was about one year into writing the book Speed Strength, which took me three years. And I slowly but surely erased, after meeting him, I slowly but surely erased that first chapter uh, that I had on speed training and biomechanics and slowly started rewriting it. And that also came with a lot of PRs uh, for myself and my athletes and sprint speed. And those were PRs for me in my early 30s when I thought that I wasn't going to have a whole lot more to give. But opening up the body, the joints, biomechanics, and getting things working as intended has such a powerful effect. So that being said, one of the things that Adarian taught me early on was the 3D motion of joints. And I remember back to the first day learning from him in a long jump uh, practice, uh, observing him, watching an athlete who was going through a 3D motion of their joints. And, and Adarian talking about how the slack was getting taken out of the system. And as we move forward, he had taught me that when we use and move our joints correctly into their fullest capabilities, we can really get more out of the elastic potential of the body. And when you do that, you don't have to be quite as strong in the weight room to be the best you can be. And if you work in 2D or two dimensions or too linearly, like the Lego man or like a lot of our, our coaching paradigms uh, end up having us in, then you do need to be stronger to facilitate that 2D motion. And again, the joint approach, the 3D approach, I think we all know is the more optimal, the one that we're moving towards this fusion and blend of both strength and joints and levers and power, and not just relying on just the binary saying, just saying force, just produce more force and those, those types of things. Anyways, that's a segue to our, our talk today, which is more in the world of weightlifting. So most of what I've learned from Adarin is more observations of body weight movement, just jumps and sprints and cuts and athletic movement and hitting and throwing. And all those things. I have learned a little bit from a daring over time in the world of uh, weightlifting, especially the things that I've kind of done over the years to probably mess myself up. But it's not something that he frequently talks about because there's looking at someone do a jump or a sprint is oftentimes there's a little bit more going on than uh, a squat per se. But Adarian has been making doing a lot of work in the world of weightlifting recently, and so I wanted to sit down and do a podcast with him on that. So we're going to get into all things, especially the Olympic list, but foot pressures, lever systems, points of awareness, essentially those things that you could watch two athletes doing, a, let's say, 150 kilo clean. And you could tell just by watching those two athletes, which one probably can jump higher, which one probably can run faster, which one is doing this in a way that if it's weightlifting, then the goal is to get the bar over your head, you know, end of story. But if we're doing this and we want some athletic, some jump sprint nuances, then now what are some things we should be looking at in that total transfer to, and in that process too, I think we just learned principles the general principles, weightlifting or not, they can also enhance performance. I know after this talk, I went right into the gym and I was able to use these in my own sprint session and then a sprint session of athletes afterwards. So that was a really good opportunity. Uh, last but not least, the first half of this talk does get a little technical. And before we get into it, it's good just to discuss the class one and class two lever systems. And I know this pre-roll is taking longer than usual, so I'll try to keep this short. But class one and class two levers, which we will talk about, 
are, and with the foot particularly, the foot and ankle, a class one lever is where the heel is the fulcrum point and the shin is swinging forward, such as uh, a calf stretch against the wall where the foot is flat on the ground and you're levering the knee forward over the heel with the heel on the ground. That is a class one lever. A class two lever of the foot would be where the ball of the foot is now the fulcrum and the heel is coming upwards as the shin passes forward. So imagine doing that calf stretch, but you're you're pressing on the ball of your foot. Well, it's not a calf stretch anymore. That motion where you're, the ball of your foot is on the ground, your heel is coming up off the ground as your knee comes forward. So it's all that's all happening as one piece. That is a class two lever action of the foot and ankle. And then to be maximally athletic, clearly athleticism, balls of the feet, forefoot dominance, or four, just being good off the forefoot, yes, this is very important. So a good transition to a class two lever is crucial. That's going to be big time when it comes to this show, and I hope that was worth the extra time. Uh, Also, I have some show notes on JustFlySports.com if you're having a hard time either wrapping your head around some of this stuff, because it does take me a lot of repetitions in many cases, but also just to serve as a nice visual as per what we're chatting about. So whether you are a speed coach, a strength coach, anywhere in between, this is a great show, and the principles are really transcendent to whatever you're trying to uh, put this into. So Let's get on to it. This uh, wonderful podcast with coach and mentor to me, Adarian Barr. Yeah, so that was, that's a good point. I I like that idea that if we rewind like 500, 1,000, 5,000 years or something like that, like everything, even even weightlifting becomes picking up a rock that, that has texture to it and a different shape. Like you have to figure it out in conjunction with lifting it. It's not just smooth or or round or you know a straight bar there's there was always like a skill component it seemed to everything you had to do from a strength perspective for the longest time until now to a degree right and most of the time you know it it was your body understanding how to use its levers because you know you had to leverage things that that if you wanted to move something you had to figure out how to leverage it you know and so that would that's the thing that goes on but yeah but you know like i said there was there was no chance of you finding a smooth round stone back in the day to pick up there's no chance of it. And so, like I said, now everybody wants instruction and stuff like that from the different devices they're using. Even I think when I did something the other day with a lever where I had the long pole with, you know, picking up something. Well, you may have had fish like that way back in the day where, where you're standing on the shore and you're trying to get something out of the river and you got this long thing. All of a sudden, that one pound fish is kind of heavy, you know, that you're trying to pick up with this rod. So, and, and people didn't recognize that, is this something you might have to do in the past, you know? And, and so, and what am I doing? I'm using my body to maximize my leverage to help me feed myself in a sense, you know? So, I think that's what we've gotten out of it, is, is that part of it, where now everything is, is pristine. You know, you go to the gym, the weights are where they are, you know, you put a 45 on this side, 45 on this side, when back in the day, it might have been 45 and 25, you just figured it out, mm-hmm. you know, how to, how to leverage to get it up and stuff like that. Or you may have to roll it up a hill, roll it down a hill, whatever the case, you know. But I think, I mean, think about it, you know, back in the day, if you had to catch a pig or something like that, a wild pig, most of the time you had to dig the hole first, you know. And then when it fell into the hole, you had to figure out how to get it out of the hole. That's all about leverage. What? what? No. <laughs> hey, let me jump down here, snatch it over my head, and jump out like Superman. That, that wasn't happening. <laughs> but that's what we think today. I'm going to just do this like Superman. No, no, no. So, so yeah, but, but how do we do these things and, and what we know already and, and everything, but, and, and why we had rules to stuff. That's the funny thing. It's like, why we had rules to things when you're like, and that's one thing about Olympic weightlifting. There really are no rules. You know, you, you have to, you know, you, you, you could, you could, because you know, like how the Chinese jerk, you know, is different than the old jerk, mm-hmm. which is different than the old jerk way, way back when. But nobody said, and it's only a matter of time for somebody say the Chinese jerk you can't do anymore. It's only a matter of time for somebody say, no, that's not a jerk anymore. They just, you know, but that's one of the beauties about that sport is that there really are no rules in a sense. This is the movement you got to do. How you really do it, we don't really care, you know. And so the, the, the thing is that people are, are learning to leverage again and, and everything. So when you get there, one of the things that happens is a basic squat. So if you got to squat and lift, one thing that's happening is this here, and this is information. If I'm going to squat, people talk about their squatting. And it's funny, like, we have problems squatting, but nobody else had problems squatting until this modern era came along, you know, because 
guess what you don't have to do? You don't have to stand by the riverbank and look for a crocodile as you wash your clothes. Mm -hmm. I bet if you had, now think about this here. If you're squatting the way we're squatting, you're trying to wash clothes next to the riverbank when it's time to escape, you have a tough time escaping. But if you squat all the way down, you can wash your clothes and still wash for the crocodile and still have time to get away. So that, that's one of those things. But when you squat down, one of the things that happens is here, the calves can rotate and pull you into that deep squat. Most people are trying to do what to get in that deep squat. They're trying to increase their ankle mobility, their ability to dorsiflex. But it's another movement. It's a rotational movement. And if you squat down and you rotate the calves, and that's why you see a lot of times, what do you see with these guys in any deep squats? Which way are the feet point? They're pointing out for a reason. Why? Because the calves are rotating and they sit them there, you know? And, and so once you do that, you can squat as deep as you want to. But we done made it complex. And like, I got to do all this, you know, what's that one they do to the, to the wall, the drill they do to the wall to check their dorsiflex range and oh, all yeah, that? Oh, yeah, yeah, you yeah. Put, yeah, put yeah. your knee next to the wall and you have to put your knee over your toe to see how far you go or whatever. Right. And then I'm going to floss the ankle and do some other stuff and da 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 da. No, man, just rotate the, just rotate the calves around the bone and you'll, you'll, you'll squat as deep as you want to squat. But that's too easy. Yeah. It is, <laughs> it is really interesting to think of the more smooth and pristine everything has got. You know, it's almost like a linear equation. Like the smoother the track surface, the running surface, the, the nicer and, and the weights and the more. Although I do appreciate that, uh, like, at least for upper body, like kettlebells and mace bells and club bells are starting to become more of a thing, more of a spiraling type effect. I, I've been a big fan of those recently. But it almost, it seems like the smoother and more pristine a thing has become, the more it has to be now coached up. But it'd be funny to think about two guys stacking like really big, heavy rocks 300 years ago, trying to coach each other, you know, oh, you gotta, you gotta hold your back like this and you gotta do this. Or even, even now in the weight room, if I had a bar and I put a 45 on one side and a 25 on the other, and I was like trying to coach the person up, oh, you gotta do this versus... It almost seems silly, like because you're you're trying to let them figure it out and, and use their body in that way, and so yeah, it's just an interesting. It's interesting. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, but I think, and that's what we're into now, where where like I said, picking up things, you know, picking up things, we just pick it up, you know, and for the most part, you figure out how to pick it up without getting hurt, you know. But but yeah, it's, it's the pristine of it and, and the rules that come in now. They feel like this is crazy. I mean, think about this as a kid. Every kid. When they walk to the water and they see a rock, what do they want to do? They want to skip the rock. Why do we? I mean, we don't even know what that is, but the first thing we do is we pick up a rock and we throw it in the water. And then we see it bounce. And we go, ooh, can I make it bounce four times? And then you try to figure out how to make it bounce four times. Then you go, huh, can I, how many times? But you know what I'm saying? We walk to the water, we see a rock, and the first thing we want to do is throw the rock into the water. And then when we see it bounce, we go, ooh, let me see how many times I can make this happen. We start figuring out how to hold the rock. Then we look for what? Hey, that round rock won't work. Let me see if I can find a flat rock. You, you know the information already. It's just a matter of putting you in a situation where the brain says, hey, do it this way. Do it this way. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, you found a flat rock, da da da, and the thing's boop, 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 and you have it. Mm. But it all started with for some strange reason, just going to the water, seeing a rock, and throwing it in and watch that thing bounce. I love that. Just I think we so oftentimes as coaches, we just forget about what it was like when we were kids. And even yeah. with my own kids, my, my kids have interest in exercise because they watch me all the time and they, they see the equipment I have and stuff like, stuff like that. But I'm always really careful to really never try to put a predisposition in their head of what something should be like. Like I just say, and <laughs> the thing is they do a lot like to lift my, uh, they like to try to lift my kettlebells and <laughs> never with the nice straight you know, flat back. And I, and I don't like them really lifting those. I mean, it's like you guys, it's almost like it's too pristine. You guys should be lifting things like these un, uneven, you know, elements. It's kind of actually yeah. weird to watch a kid lift a, a little bit of an unnatural weight in a sense. So I'm, yeah. I try to limit <laughs> the, them doing that, but it's fun to just watch them try to solve the, the movement problem. And, and I'm very conscious of it. If I put anything in their head rather than just letting them figure something out with in a more organic state, it's going to, probably mess them up to some context down the road plus i just like watching how they solve strategies and even my son who's two and a half is like learning to throw and you just watch him create like the collision with his lead block leg he just figures yeah. it out he's like oh i'll throw this leg in front and oh this ball goes faster and it's just i'm just the observer that's all i am i'm the observer i'm not trying to tell him to do anything it's just fun to watch like how kids will experiment until they can find something yeah, and like I said, but but what's happening, they have this untapped knowledge that comes out. You know, every time they do something, 
the, the more knowledge comes out. More knowledge comes out. More, like you said, they, they the more knowledge comes out. Instead of saying, I'm just gonna stick with this two percent, you know, <laughs> it starts to it starts to expand, expand, then all of a sudden they get this whole oh, okay then. But but yeah, that's even like um, I was talking to somebody today, we were talking about hundred meter times and stuff. And and it's like nineteen sixty eight, uh, you know, you, uh, in twenty nineteen, I think nineteen guys ran sub ten second hundred meter. You know. And 2009, I think it was five. And 2001, it was three. And you go, why is that still such a strange number when 10 seconds was the cut back in 1968? You know, you go, man, you're trying to tell me it's taking us over 50 years. 50 years of better this, the pristine world. And yet, that's all. And, and the whole, we talk about the whole world now. So, so back then, you're talking about the number of people that participated in 100 back in 1968 versus now. We still at one, basically. If we, if we, if we, factor it, we still have one person 50 years later. <laughs> yeah, Pristine world. That's what it's got, man. <laughs> yeah, the, the, I just always am just so amazed by the intelligence of the body and letting, even when I'm just training now, just always trying to kind of plug in and see what my, how is my body wanting to handle this problem and this element. And it is nice to have learned a lot of these elements from you. I, I'm thinking more about what are my feet doing? What are the, what's the pressure in my feet like? How are my legs circling? as I do right. this this movement and just asking, kind of being observer of those things. And I don't think I would have been able to observe as well before you, but as a child, perhaps with no predispositions, perhaps I could have subconsciously, you know, and I think that that's, that's important. But anyways, I want to get to the main thing that I wanted to at least start with, because I know to me, this is a trip, you know, it's like Adarian's getting back into weightlifting, again. <laughs> which of course, I mean, uh, I don't know, it's just funny. Um, yeah, so because I know you had told me back in the day you you had done a lot of lifting and then you actually set a bunch of PRs when you just stopped for a year and and now but I'm sure now that comes with a different context. So well, let's start by just share your maybe your background with in history with weightlifting and when you did it, when you didn't, and what you learned, and then maybe let's transition to what you're doing now and what you're trying to get out of it. I always had this this bad feeling about weightlifting, and you know, started in high school with high school football and everything, you know, because I didn't get a chance to, to play as much as I should have because I wasn't in the weight room. You know, and it was like, you're not in the weight room. I don't feel like lifting weights, you know? And they said, well, if you don't lift weights, you got da 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 you know? And, and like, but let's see. You know, the one time they did let me play, you know, I go from this bench guy to they said, hey, man, I think we're going to start you the next game. What happened to my lift, with, lifting weight thing? I still haven't done that. Oh, but you recognize I can play now, you know? And I, and I always always thought that that, equating athletic ability to weightlifting was, was just bad, you know? And then the same thing, you know, when I, when I triple jumped 50 feet in high school, everybody's like, when you start lifting weights, you're going to jump so much further. You know, well, how come the guy who's lifting weights can't jump 50? You know? So, so once again, and so that's always been my thing is, is that, you know, people made the, the weightlifting the athletic ability when it's like, mm -hmm. this is it's just weightlifting, you know? And I don't think I really started lifting weights until, you know, I mean, think about this here, where, where even I was in the military, you know, I was 21 years old, hadn't really trained and everything. And I remember, you know, getting out of the military and going to, to trying to get trying to get into college again on a scholarship. And everybody told me, that, well, we don't know your marks. We know what you did four years ago, but we don't know your marks now. So I trained for a week, jumped 23 seven the long jump and jumped 49 11 the triple jump. No weightlifting, no training, no nothing. So, so, so my ability was my ability without the weightlifting. It didn't make me, you know, then like I said, when I got to college, I started lifting weights and everything. And, and I don't know how much better I got from the weightlifting. You know, I, I don't know, you know, like I said, I, I got better, but was it the weightlifting? Don't know. But, but then, you know, all of a sudden I run to this one guy um, uh, and I, and I, like I said, I got pretty good at it and stuff. And I ran to this one guy, you know, he was, uh, uh, he was my, my triple jump coach. He's from Poland. And, um, he told me, "Hey man, stop lifting those weights." <laughs> so, 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 so in, in the early career, the guy says, "Hey man, you're strong enough. Stop lifting those weights." You know, I was like, "What?" You know, he says, "You know, you, you, you know." So, so he's told me to stop lifting weights, and guess what? When I stopped lifting the weights, boom, triple jump got two foot better. Boom, hundred improved two tenths. You know, everything got better when I stopped lifting the weights. So I always had this adversarial thing that that the, that the weightlifting didn't make me athletic. You know, and and and, and so. You know, even when I was in, you know, as a coach, whatnot, did I, you know, my athletes flipped the weights because that's what we're supposed to do, you know, uh, and, and everything. But then once again, I don't know how much better it made them, you know, but, but, you know, and you, and you talk about some of these things, you know, I, I went through Olympic weightlifting training and all this other kind of stuff. Just didn't get it. Just didn't get it. You know, I didn't, I didn't get the transference, you know, so I was like, I don't get it. I can lift heavy shit, but 
<laughs> yeah. See, we are stupid, you yeah. know? And that guy over there that looks skinnier than me, I don't think he lifts anything, but he's faster than me, you know? <laughs> and, and, and so it, it was it was one of those crazy things that, that, that you look at. But now this is the end of it, and this is why I'm getting back into it now, because it finally came back full circle, like, oh, okay. Because I started watching, you know, I, I watch a lot of Chinese weightlifters and everything. And so watching now, I was like, oh, because I'm seeing levers. You know, I see the levers, I see them. And I'm thinking like, oh, okay. And I'm watching the guy, you know, stay as close to class two lever as possible as he gets the bar up to his knees. As soon as the bar gets over his knees, he's jammed back into class two. When he goes to class two, because he can stand on class two, he makes that first pull with the upper, with the upper body. You know, now what, has, what, what happens then at that point in time is he has an option. I can go to class one or I can just be done with this class two and get out underneath this thing. Yeah. You know? Uh, can we and define those real quick, class. those levers? Like what class one, because uh, just with people who might not be familiar um, with the, with those levers. So, uh, yeah. So class one is, is, is just the focal point is at the ankle, uh, which is basically the, the shin moving without the heel moving. And, and so class two is at the ball of the foot where the shin and the, or the knee and the heel will move together. You know, and that's the easy way to separate them out is that if your knee's moving down, the heel's still on the ground, you're in a class one lever mode. The knee's moving down and the heel's moving with it, you're in a class two mode. You know, same thing. If the knee's moving up and the heel's moving down, class two mode. If the knee's moving up, heel is not moving, class one mode. Yeah, so you were saying that weightlifter. And I believe, I did you mean class one? Like he was that first pull off the ground when the bar starts on, you know, on the ground and his knees are way forward over the bar. You were saying he's staying class, I think you said class two as long as possible. But did you mean class one as long as possible there with the heels on the ground until that? Or did... No, most of those guys are in a class two mode. Really, so off the ground. Up, as they as they as they pull the weight off the ground, he's, the, most of these guys are trying to stay at the class two. Like heels you actually see, off or depressurized. No, no, no. What I'm saying is they at the they at the beginning when the knee and the heel would move together. So they at the they at the beginning of a class two mode. Oh, got it. Because the knees are so far forward, it just forces the the knee and the heel moving together. Yeah, Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Class, yeah, and so you see some people they will the knees the shin will go vertical, you know as the heel stays on the ground, which is class one, then the bar clears the knees and then they go class one to get back to class two type thing where some of these other guys, when they, as soon as the knee clears, they're back in class two. They don't even mess with class one. They're back in class two. But, but the, the difference is between a class one and a class two is this here. When you're in class two mode, you, you support it. You can stand on the foot. When you're in class one mode, you're not supported anymore, which is why you see people get to the edge of their toes and they drop like a rock because you're not supported anymore in that class one mode. If you're in class two mode, you can, stay, you, can, you can stand on it. So you see a lot of these guys make that initial pull while in class two mode. Got it. Um, is that why, I mean, I think typically if you're a more explosive athlete, uh, like a you know, good jumper and good sprinter, the the power. Well, and this is where I'm try, still trying to figure it out with the Olympic lifts. And I was going to say as well, I, I'd imagine back in your, I know that I think the listeners should know too. Like you, you may have not been like the most fond of weightlifting in a lot of points in your career. For and like you said, when you stopped, you were strong enough. But you were a strong dude. Like I, I remember watching you deadlift like 450, <laughs> not even having lifted. Like you had natural strength, and you're a pretty strong dude. Like it's not like you're a guy who just squats 200 and it's like all oh, weightlifting's you know you've <laughs> right right <laughs> right right no no i mean even at one time i, I think i bench pressed 315 at one time so yeah i mean i could put up weight you know it was it was, it was no big deal and everything uh, uh but but yeah yeah no i'm not uh, yeah i'm not that little guy that, that just is just talking to be talking bad about weights you know i actually like i said i actually lifted them yeah i had fun lifting i, I don't mind lifting weights but i just didn't like it being equated to my athletic ability Sure. You know that, that, that you know that, that, that was old, and, and that's still the day where a lot of people equate it, lifting to athletic ability. That, that the lift makes you athletic. Uh, okay, whatever. <laughs> but I, I, you know, but but for me, like I said, the biggest thing was that you know once I, you know when I see the levers, and, and then you go, oh, okay, then. So then you know, like I talked to somebody today, and we talk about how uh, some people when they lift to get strong. And I send them a video, and you see the person, you know, shrug. They doing it. They they doing a clean. And they shrug, then they do a, a plantar flex, which is a class one lever, mm -hmm. then they catch the bar. That's not gonna transfer over. Yeah, no, not at all. But, but what are they doing? They're probably looking to get stronger. And so if you're looking to get stronger, that'll work. I mean, you'll get stronger, 
Yeah, that's that's what happened to me for all those years. So let's deconstruct this a little bit, because I think this would be a great point, just kind of deconstructing the Olympic lifts in light of levers. And so, again, I, I, I would encourage anyone, if you don't understand the levers, um, maybe I can put something in the show notes, too, on the Just Fly Sports main page, just that visually has that. Because I think the, this, the class one and class two is one of the biggest realizations I learned from you in this last year. And it's kind of stuff I think we see it, we just kind of know it. Like, oh, that guy was on the heel really long as the shin passed over, that calf wasn't working, versus being able to get up on the balls of the feet more quickly, um, being in class two mode. But so well, the first thing I was going to ask you is that, yeah, the typical, um, like a, like a, a jumper, a triple jumper, a sprinter, someone who's fast and explosive, is that a big reason that they're power clean where they can lift it and catch it a lot higher versus someone who, like you said, they, it's like they're, they're, they're on their heels and they just get the bar moving and then they have to dive back under it. Um, so that's like a, the big difference from a lever perspective, uh, is just someone who's better and faster at getting to class two, getting to the balls of the feet where they're stable to produce that vertical motion is going to generally be more athletic than someone who can't get to the ball of the feet and just has to drop. I hope that makes sense. Well, yeah, but that's, and that's what we talk about. A lot of times we see, like, there's a video out there of Safa Powell doing, I think, a power clean, you know, and everything. And people are like, ooh, well, no, that's what he does. It's in his, it's in, it's in his range of his levers. That he, he, does that, he does that all day, you know. Is he going to make a good Olympic weightlifter? Probably not, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. But can he lift heavy things from that position? Yes. Why? Because he does it. That's a, that's a regular movement for him as far as, as a lever movement, you know, where, where, like you said, he's in that class two. I'm in this class two. I'm stable. I'm going to pull this thing. I'm going to drop underneath. So that's what running is. I mean, that's, that's basically, like you said, I'm in this class two. It's going to release. I got to get to the next one do it again. So I think that's the relationship. And then we, then we, switch, we flip it. You know, what, what do they say? They say, look at the numbers he's doing. That's why he's fast. No. No, he's doing those numbers because he's fast. See, he should go to other, because he's fast, he can lift those numbers. Not the numbers gave him the, the, the speed. That's where it gets flipped at all the time, where all of a sudden the weightlifting made him fast. No, he was fast, and he's fast. He can lift weights because he's fast. I wanted to take a quick break from the show to talk to you about two units that Simply Faster now has out that are excellent for training data collection in measuring bar speeds, sprint metrics, limb speeds, and more. The first is the VMAX Pro. If you're interested in barbell tracking technology that is affordable for the individual athlete in the garage gym, but yet is accurate enough to be trusted by professional teams, then you might be interested in the VMAX Pro. The VMAX Pro is a tiny sensor that attaches to the barbell or even the body to help with lifting and jump training metrics. It'll give you immediate feedback for jumps, lifts, and even measure the motion of the bar in 3D. It includes a travel pouch, and the associated app works on both Android and iOS devices. You can auto-regulate with precision with the VMAX Pro. The second unit is the Muscle Lab IMU. If you want to take your movement training to the next level, then the IMU is something you would definitely want to look into, as it's a pocket-sized sensor that can attach anywhere on the body and deliver research-grade motion real-time. With it, you can collect ground contact times during sprints, limb speeds for jumping and throwing, and even support return to play metrics. The sensor fuses with the rest of the Muscle Lab sensor system for even deeper insights. You can improve your movement data and get measurement that matters today with the Muscle Lab IMU unit. You can improve the depth of your workout metrics with these two pieces of technology. And if you're interested, you can head on over to simplyfaster.com. That's simply with an I, faster.com. Check out their online store where you can find these pieces and improve the depth of your training metrics today. Let's get on back to the show. Yeah, I like my I've had an interesting relationship with my Olympic lifts and my outputs. My one of my most most athletic years of my life, I was 21 and I, I had jumped seven feet and triple jump pretty well and I was I was probably the fastest I'd ever been and I remember my clean that year was like 40 pounds less than the year before <laughs> and because I and it wasn't that I wasn't doing it it was actually a lot of it was the year before I, I was doing a lot of lifting on my own and just decided I really would be better I would be a better athlete if I went really heavy in cleans and and I was doing heavy doubles and triples all the time and I got my clean up to like 245 at weighing about 180 and and but I was not that good that year. I was and I was slow. Like yeah, my jumping was bad, but my sprinting was worse. <laughs> and <laughs> the next year, I was lifting with the the coach's regimen and more. And and actually, it's funny because he had a lot of tens and eights for Olympic lifts in the fall, like doing tens. 
at like r- around the 10. But I think honestly, just by virtue of not going heavy in it and just having to be more rhythmic, maybe I just stayed on the foot more. Or I think it was like when I was really going heavy that I was just getting into the heel and staying class one probably too long to get the weight. And right. and that is what killed me. Even though I was getting stronger, it was not off the ball, the foot stronger. It was more of a uh, stay class one. And then when you go to sprint, you're, you're just, you know, disconnecting yourself. So I, uh, that was something that I had really, uh, that right. was important yeah. for me. Well, I think even, even one of the things too, that, you know, as I'm watching the, the weightlifting stuff is, um, how I used to, I, I used to think these, they, they were bumping the bar with their hips. And bumping it over, mm-hmm. you know, and using physics to bump the bar to, to swing it up and everything. But once again, now that, now that, you know, you watch a bit closer, you go, ooh, and, and what do you see? That actually class two, when they hit the bar, it bumps them backwards. So, it, 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 so they actually jump backwards to get underneath. Yeah, that's so, how I always used to kind of catch it. It was, I was always, I would always typically hop back a little bit in a catch. I always wondered why that was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It allows, because it allows, because where, because you got to remember where the bar's going. It's kind of a weird thing. Where's the weight going? The weight's going that way. So you, once again, that's like running. We're trying to meet at this great position, you know? And, and so, uh, uh, but that was, but that, but if you load it as a class two, that works like magic because you, you load it and then, the bar bumps you, and then boom, everything releases backwards, and it looks like a jump, but it's, it's really not a jump. It's just a reaction to a class two being loaded, and the bar hitting you at that point in time, and boom, you go backwards, and everything works out. And so, and so, then you get people say jump, and then ooh, that's a whole new ball game again, you know. But you know, if I'm coming out of blocks, guess what? That's what I want to do. Except I'm gonna go forward now. I'm trying to load this class two lever so much that boom, it releases, and off I go, you know. And I, and I think, you know, even when people start talking about, you know, quad dominant, knee dominant, things like that, and like I've been telling people, what's your Achilles doing? What's your feet doing? You know, because the Achilles, if the Achilles isn't working then you, you will be quad dominant or hamstring dominant. If the Achilles, if the Achilles is working, it doesn't matter. It won't, it won't even matter at that point in time. Yeah. Let's, uh, I want to touch on that too. That's definitely the Achilles in the weight room is on my question list, but I want to get it to a few more points on Olympic lifting. And so one of the points that was intriguing as well uh, and so, well, before I get to that point, so you would generally say that someone who, if, if you had to pick out, if you had an Olympic lifting meet and you had to pick out the Olympic lifter that you felt was the best athlete, they're going to do the best on the field, like jumping and sprinting and just sell and you know, change the directions. You would say the person who can generally stay class two the longest or more, doesn't really go class one as much is probably going to be the better athlete or. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Who have, the one that transitions the fastest from class one to class two. The one that's more reliant on class one is going to be a slower athlete. Yeah, and so the, the class one is just basically people who are like maybe more who have sat back more. Like you can just tell their weights on their heels a little longer. It's maybe a slower tra- – like I'd be curious what that looks like in the second pull. So once the bar passes the knees and you're going to – the knees have to come forward to, to help that bar come up in the second pull – are you saying someone who, when the knees come forward, those heels are staying on the ground, or is there any peculiarities in that motion that is really going to cater to a class one action that's going to keep people less athletic? Well, you well you you have two class one motions, and so people, it, you know, and I, and I discussed that in levers that there's, there's two class one motions: it's eversion, inversion, eversion is a class one motion, and plantar flex, dorsal flex is a class one motion. Mm. So. The ones that go plantar flex, dorsal flex as a class one are in trouble. The ones that go eversion, inversion as a class one, you're about to really do something. Why? Oh, yeah. Because basically you just blew out your ankle. And guess what's going to happen? The body's going to protect the ankle. So that's why you see that. That's why you see that fast release because you're in a position where the body says, uh uh-uh, uh, and it's going to make you pull your feet and put them back down solid and off you go to the races. So, and that's what you see a lot of times, too, is that you see, like I tell them, you know, they basically blew out their ankle. You know, you can see it flex out. That's another class one, you know. So, so they go from class, that class two, to a class one that's reflective, re- reflexive. And that reflexive class one saves the day. And you can do that out of blocks, too. You can do that out of blocks. You know, you can do that when jumping. But like I said, it's, 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 it's a class one, but it's a reflexive class one. And it's like you will be saved every single time. Okay, so you're saying that's a good thing, like that the e- inversion, yeah. eversion class one. So you're inverting, and evering the ankle, like, and then trying to ride that to the class two. That's the athletic mode, not the 
just knee goes straight over the toe like the wall flexion drill or the wall right. dorsiflexion right. drill into class two, right. you'd be screwed then. I feel like your Achilles would explode or something. <laughs> right, right, right. And the reason it works is once again, you got to remember, if the calves are twisting and so the feet are twisting. And so it just, you just wound so tight at that point in time, it just pops. You know, and, and so that that becomes the thing that uh, at that point in time you maximize class two to class one, and boom, off the ground you come. I've kind of I had I've had a realization this summer that the most athletic guys I think back to the most athletic guys and girls that I've worked with who just they they may or may not have been good in the weight room, but regardless, some were, some weren't, but they could just jump and sprint and super explosive, and they always had almost yeah either that more of a kind of like an eversion element like like a twist element into the uh, ankle through the lower leg like it wasn't it's like their their legs weren't just like straight up and down they almost were I guess you could say they were bow-legged but it was more it wasn't so much the bow-legged fact I think one guy actually was the other way <laughs> but it was just yeah. more the fact that it was there was some twisting like that created an inversion and eversion moment and now the yeah. calves had to twist and that twist was what created a lot of their abilities versus like if it's linear, it's just more muscle and it's a little bit slower. Right, right. And there's no support. That's the whole thing. If you go linear, there's really that's why, like I said, you see it in running where where people are are go class one and they have the tip of the toes. And all that's gonna happen is you drop because grab is gonna grab you. There's no support in class one. And the same thing. If you go E version class one, guess what? There's still no support, but the body and that's what's happening. There's no support. So what's the brain gonna do? Danger. Let's save the day because that's the beauty of the brain. It's not going to let you hurt yourself. It really isn't going to let you hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. So at this point in time, it's going to save the day for you. It's going to pull it. It's going to make them things jump off the ground and pull you back down into a safe position. You know, uh, um, um, that becomes the beauty of it. And, like, and that's, that's one of my sayings that I always tell people. I'm trying to crash the plane. And I'm just sitting the brain on autopilot. But a lot of people are trying to fly without the autopilot. You mm -hmm. better put the autopilot back on and then crash it. And make sure <laughs> the autopilot is actually working. It basically crash the plane, but let the brain take care of it. Let, let the brain take care of it. Yeah. Let, let it land the play. I'm trying to crash this bad boy. The brain's like, ah, I'm going to land the play. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to put this in the show notes because I feel like this is the ultimate personification, or, you know, um, uh, not personification. I don't know what the word is. I'm just trying to think of an analogy. But, okay, <laughs> like, so I just did this, um, I just wrapped up this plyometric presentation for Track Football Consortium. And I, I put in it, and again, you were the first person to really show me this, but. Uh, people who are just destroying the shoe, especially in high jump, uh, or, or where they're they're jumping, and it's like, are you see this in dunking too, uh, basketball, where people who could really get up, is the shoe like it literally like wraps around their ankle, so it looks like they're literally jumping with their feet on the like the sole comes completely off the ground, oh, right, right, and I'm right. still trying to figure out how in the world that works. Like, so I I posted and I'll put this in the show notes. So whoever's listening, definitely go to the show notes and check this out. But it was Donald Thomas high jumping, and it was like his seven eight and a half jump at the Olympics, yeah. and just you know technique looked like trash, but for the most part. Yeah. But that is the most like his the sole of his shoe was completely twisted off the ground in that takeoff. I could not – I was like, what is this foot even doing right now? It clearly isn't that <laughs> twisted. But but that, yeah. to me, is the ultimate example of going almost like an, the high jump takeoff, like on a, on a curve, or probably why people, when you go to jump and dunk, you don't just run straight in. You run on a curve probably to take advantage of that. Let's create a twisting force in the class one. Let's create an eversion force, and then let's, let's go class two to the ball of the foot real fast versus – Nobody just runs straight in. <laughs> right, 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 right. And that's why, that's why, you know, I said the other day that everything is rotational. The direction is linear, but the movement is rotational, you know. And, and so, you know, even though we think the arms are moving in this linear fashion, it's really rotating, or legs, whatever, everything's rotating, you know. And that's, that's like, you know, why even with, with as the shin change, the torso should change with it, which means everybody's rotating in the same direction. Even though you're moving linear, you're actually on the wheel and you're just rolling around in a sense. So that becomes the whole thing. But yeah, it, it, it's, 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 it's weird that, you know, people don't let the brain work. You know, like I said, we, and we back to this, what we started with, huh? I pick up a rock, throw it in the yeah, water. Lifting, yeah. Huh? Let me see what I can do. Make this thing skip more. You know, let the brain work. You just, all you tell us, I want to, I, I want this rock to skip four or five times. Okay. Well, you need a different rock. How do you know you need a different rock? I don't know, but the brain knows you need a different rock than the one you're using. 
And what you find, what you look for, you look for that smooth, flat rock all of a sudden. That's you walk up down the whole beach looking for that smooth, flat rock because your brain told you this one you need. And then all of a sudden, boom, oh, it works out. Hold it this way. Don't hold it this way. But once again, we don't let this thing work for us. We, 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 we think we're smarter than it. That's the problem. Yeah, I think you could extrapolate what you said there to pretty much everything in the athletic world, like lifting, squatting, deadlifting, you know, chest up, brace real hard. Well, where's the brain working? What, what are you giving the brain to work with? You know, like or sprinting, lift your knee really high, step over the knee, lift it really high and stomp it down. What are you giving the brain to work with? Like, where's the... Where's like the sensory interface with what's going on here? You're yeah, just none, we, none, none, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I that's powerful, man. Uh, okay, so all right, I'm gonna stay on Olympic lifting. I'm sure I could get. I probably have. Yeah, I know we need to get to Achilles too, and 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 things like that. But so uh, in an Olympic lift, so the and, and maybe later too, maybe we could even if we could get examples of someone who's class one versus class two quicker, that would be cool. There's a there was this. Um, a Russian lifter, I think it was Yurik Vardanian. He was like, uh, he was like 198 pounds and he cleaned like 500, cleaned his jerk 500, which has just, I'm just like trying to think about putting even, a, you know, even half that over my head weighing 185. I mean, that's like, that's, that's a pretty substantial effort. And I, and he high jumped, I think he high jumped seven feet off three steps or something like that. Maybe I'll have to get that one in there for your analysis of his lever actions versus uh, perhaps a, a different lifter. Uh, so, uh, but I wanted to get touch on as well with, uh, off the ground. Cause I know that's something you've been talking about. So when you set up uh, with the bar at the shins and you're, you're, you're pulling the bar off the ground, can you tell, uh, can you give a little insight as to this, like some foot pressures, creating pressure, torque, class one, class two, uh, when I'm going to pull the bar off the ground in that, uh, clean, like what are some, some things going there that might transfer to athleticism? Well, it, 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 well, like I said, it all depends on, on how you're setting it up. If you're doing a regular just, just fold up, linear fold up, you know, the, the foot won't feel any pressure, you know, because the pressure is being relieved based on you folding up. It's actually being relieved off of the foot. And, and so, what ha- once again, when you're back to the same thing, what has to happen, the calf is going to initiate that pressure on the foot. It's going gonna, it's gonna, to, because once the calf, one of the things too, once the calves twist, the arch is set with you. So, so, so if I twist my calf, it transfers arch, all the arch. So that starts the process right there. So once I'm there, now my Achilles is set too. So, so it all starts with that one move. And as I try to squat down, move the calves out of the way. And if you move the calves out of the way, everything else is going to work down below that. If you do the regular, you know, uh, fold at the ankle, fold at the knee, fold at the hips type drop, you'll never feel foot pressure. And so at that point in time, it was telling you anything, the pressure at the hand. The, the hand's going to tell you what's happening at that hmm. point in time. So you're relying on, on pressure at the hand to tell you what to do with this bar. Yeah, I like I like the idea. And I relate that to one of my recent big breakthroughs in sprinting has just been really pressure at the foot oriented variations of things. And so I think about what you were saying, because I think that the typical way to set up and I've always this always did feel better to me was to instead of just squatting straight down, knees go straight over toes, you take your knees out uh, to create a little more torque. And originally I was like, oh, that helps my back, but I never really thought about it from a foot perspective. So basically what you're saying is um, when you squat down to grab the bar, the more pressure you can load your feet with and where the feet is the first sensory control. And then ideally, uh, that that's one, that's one thing. And then also the knees should ideally be, I mean, probably out. I mean, I wouldn't think starting with the knees in is probably the optimal situation there, but I mean, you... The, the, then the second pole, it's the second pole, though, they're going to go in a little bit oftentimes. And not always, not in like the Chinese guys, but I know like a lot of high jumpers, like elastic athletes, second pole, those knees will come in on the class too. But so um, I don't even know what's that. Anyways, what, I, what I'm asking well, is, yeah, so just following up on that. Yeah, well, well no, like I said, it, that's, that's the whole thing is that once, because like we talked earlier, you know, one of the first jobs is to sense this movement in, in, in where you are in space and time and how much the load is on the body. So, but it can't do that until they've been pressurized in a sense, you know? Mm. So, so once the calf do they think it's your pressure, now you pull this bar, it knows exactly what's going on, which means you could do this slow pull because the feet are telling you where you are versus the hands telling you what's going on. So that becomes the difference is, is relying on sensory information from the hands to lift or relying on sensory information from the foot to lift. And that becomes the, the, the biggest difference. And then what do people say? Improve your grip strength. Yeah, of course, improve your grip strength. Your feet are not telling you anything. Mm-hmm. 
yeah, you're 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 forced to kind of almost. And I, I I do think I wonder. I don't know how you'd measure it, but one of those elements in the weight room. I, and I know like the Marin, Marinovich training systems kind of highlighted this to me is that too many people, too many things in the weight room, oftentimes just closed hand, closed grip oriented. Everything's just wrap your hand around a bar, and it it's it's a feed forward from the grip, but. Like what, then what happens, you know, we need to prioritize the feet. And and so I know the Marinovich right. training system, everything was pretty much open-handed. They used the super cats and the Kaisers and, and whatnot. But, um, what was I, where was I going with this? Um, I don't remember. I, 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 I have like three, two balls in my, in the air <laughs> well, and I'm trying to catch one. So. Day, was, before we got on, I was out front wrecking my yard, you know, uh, and everything. And, and what did I notice that if I, you know, grip the rake, it was much different than if I use thumb pressure, thumb pressure and thumb pressure. All of a sudden, my chest is what's moving the rake now. You know, it mm. becomes a chest exercise to rake the yard as opposed to a arm exercise. And, and, but like I said, what happened? Sensory information switched up. Yeah. You know, where, where, where there's, this thing doesn't weigh anything. So what is, so, so see what I'm saying? The rake doesn't weigh anything. And I got levers on my side. So as you rake, if you, well, what it, you know, once the thumbs push and then they feel the resistance, now it's like, oh, let's get some help on this. So, so, so it's the same thing, you know. A lot of what we do is, is still tactile information that, that's telling us stuff. But if we don't set up to use the tactile information, then at that point in time, yeah, the brain's going to fill in the gaps for you. It's probably an under uh, appreciated part of just doing a push up. I mean, just because your hands are actually on the ground again, probably a flat gym surface. <laughs> but right. do you have any like it, it, from from a, a push up perspective with that? Do you have any ideas there on using the the hands better based off the rake analogy? Like if I'm just doing a push up and I want to use um, make it maybe less hand centric or or forearm or arm centric and more into the 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 core of the body. Do you have any ideas there on what might be useful? Yeah, yeah, it's the same thing. I mean, it comes back to you got to set the thumbs up. So, so you guys set the thumbs up to feel some more pressure. That, that's usually when you're doing a push-up, guess who's not feeling pressure? The thumb. Mm. And so once the thumb feels more pressure, it changes everything. You know? So it's just setting up the thumb up to feel more, to feel more pressure and gives you more information as, as far as how much load is actually on the body. Because you know? other than that, you put your palms down, the wrist is telling you what's on the body, which a lot of times people go, I can't do a push-up. You can't do a push-up because your wrist is telling you, get off me. That's, that's why you can't do a push-up. <laughs> it's like, leave, get off me. You know? So once you put the thumb down, then some things start to change because now it says, okay, this is how much weight this is, so forth and so forth, and, and everything. Because other than that, you got to remember uh, uh, the, the body understands gravity really well. It understands it really well. It understands gravity acting upon you really well. You know, it doesn't really know that there's 140 pounds on top of me. It doesn't know it's a, it just knows this is, this, is, this is the mass. This is the mass. And whatever it is, we can deal with it based on the fact that I can feel the, the weight of the mass. If I can't feel the weight of the mass at that point in time, I got to guess about what I'm going to do. You're listening to the Just Fly Performance Podcast, brought to you by Simply Faster. Yeah, uh, something you were telling me before, I think before we had this talk today, but it was about Chinese lifters who, uh, it's almost like they're using on that first pull of the Olympic lift off the ground, they're pushing, they're pressing their knees out uh, to create more pressure, I believe you were saying. Uh, like, yes. it's almost like they're, and that's where I always felt like it was interesting. Like they're doing that second pull with the knees way out, whereas a jump reversal, the knees would be in. So maybe that's a big difference. But regardless, like they're, I mean, and they're Olympic lifters. They're not high jumpers. It's a, well, well, it's actually, it's actually the same thing because if you, if you look at which way the foot is pointed, the same thing's happening. So once you, once the knees are out and the feet are pointed out, guess what? It's the same inward movement as, a, as with a jump. It's just a matter of which way. You know, a lot of times people want to, like, like taking these sprinters, you know, people go, they feet turn out. Well, why do they feet turn out? Because the calf turned it. Mm. It's not an external rotation of the leg. It's the fact that the calf is rotating that bad boy. And so by the time you hit the ground, the calf rotates it, which way the foot's going to point out. But what does that do? That sets you up to go inside edge, you know. And, and so what's feeling that pressure now? you got to figure them arches are feeling that pressure now, and it's telling exactly where you are time and space. Boom, you can go. Got it. Uh, so one of the the more, I guess you could say, one of the times in my life that I did feel particularly athletic, I think it was 27. And there's a video of me on YouTube. I was doing some full, uh, I'd always loved this lift. Like this lift of all Olympic lifts made me feel uh, particularly athletic um, more than doing um, 
like just a power clean. And, and I found later in life that just doing that doing a bar bar speed measured cleans where it had to be very fast seemed to transfer way more. And again, maybe you can make the argument for there's more class two when the speed's faster. You probably went more class two off the ball of the foot to make it happen versus a class one. Um, you know, maybe, maybe not, but if you can get those arches of the feet going, hope, hopefully, but I really, I felt like doing a full catch snatch was just always helped me feel really athletic. And I was watching a video of myself doing it. And I did, um, I always think about the cue, like, um, almost like hamstrings to calves at the bottom or whatever, but not that I was doing it, but I was watching, I was kind of knees out on the first pole, creating torque. And then I would catch it with a knees in like the, the classical Olympic lifter, uh, where they have that knees are ticking in, in the catch and my knees were going way over my toes. And I was just thinking, wow, there's a lot of foot pressure happening here. <laughs> there's, <Yeah. laughs> it just seemed like a really good foot pressurization system versus, um, uh, anything else. So I, I, do you have any thoughts on like the catch or the, 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 the Olympic catch and what's happening with foot pressure inside edge, internal rotation, torque? Well, yeah, I think it's all the same. Like, it depends on how you catch it. You know, there, there's a catch where the weight's not moving. There's a catch where the weight's dropping upon you and it's going to crush you again. But once again, the, you, you, and where, where them, calves, them, calves are, them calves are pushing out and everything's dropping to feel it, you know. So, so you're still dealing with the, the, the same issue, you know, even like, you know, like even with crawling. You know, I, was doing a, I, I just put a crawling series on, 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 on barrunning.com and everything. And, 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 and the, People crawl linear, but guess what? If you start crawling and like the lizard runs, you know, where when you pick up the Mm. foot, go ahead and rotate that calf, go ahead and pull them heels around, it's a different crawl. Hmm. You know, it's a a totally different crawl, but people crawl like they, 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 like the robot, they crawl like a robot, you know, very that, 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 that. No, once you rotate that calf, then, then guess what? Shin angles change, and you don't have to raise your butt up to get your leg through. It just because shin angles change, another one's coming through. But you got to understand what am I focused on now? And, and, and at the same time, when I crawl, if I'm really getting into a crawl, I got to trust falling on my hands again. So my thumbs better work for me, because if you hit if you hit palm flat, it's going to jam up through the shoulders and elbows. Mm. But if you, hit, if you hit on the on the thumb, guess what? Information's there again, and all of a sudden it changes the whole aspect of it. So, so that becomes the thing is that that people are crawling like the robot when you shouldn't crawl like that. You should crawl based on the, the same rotation. Like I said, whether we're standing up, lying down on our backs, on our bellies, it's the same movement. So just as I would rotate the calf to do a lift, I'm going to rotate the calf to crawl because I still want that pressure on the foot to tell me something. And, that, and now even with that there, with the foot being pressurized in a sense, I can still manipulate my arch. To work for me without that the foot's gonna flop around for you and you can't manipulate the arch to work for you yeah it's your you're saying that i, I think it, and i've i have really been obsessed with crawling in um in rotational manners for probably the last i guess the last year i just did a presentation um i uh a little uh what do you call it, workshop at a gym uh working with the the group and and they're running and sprinting and you could just see who the most like robotic and all strength coaches and you could see the people who are the most rigid and robotic we just did crawling to actually learn to not be rigid and you would see the people who ran super rigid super tight shoulders didn't move hips didn't move you get them to crawl and they're just like it's like the lego man like a like a brick like a two by four trying to crawl (laughs) you're gonna see the same thing and so we were working on like getting the ribs moving and getting some circles going and stuff like that. But um, one of those, I talked about the calf spiraling in these athletes that I've seen over the years. And one of the most athletic guys was uh, uh, when I was at Cal working with men's tennis, this Japanese um, tennis player who hadn't, he hadn't lifted uh, it, all the way coming up into Cal, but he could, he was like 5'10", he could almost dunk. He was really fast. I mean, probably sub 1100 speed, I would say almost for sure, like blazing and the way this guy would crawl, it's almost like he his knees were always doing these big circles. He was working full outside edge to inside edge of his foot, versus versus the other guys were were not nearly that. So I was I should have videoed him crawling. Like I wish I would have, because I've always been trying to emulate that and using that as a teaching tool. But it's safe. so the thumbs you're saying are inside edge and crawling. Like thumbs are kind of like inside edge version of the feet, really. If we had to think of a push up or a crawl. Right, 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 right. So I, but I, I got to trust that. And that's what that's the whole thing about it. 
because you're about to fall, you know, like I said, you're about to fall onto your hands. And so really what should happen is there, there's two types of crawls. There's that walk crawl, you know, and then there's more of a trot crawl. And if you go to the trot crawl, you should never have two hands on the ground at the same time because you're on your legs. And so if, if, the, if the ribs are supporting you, these things will come around and reach out in front for you. And then the feet come off the ground. And so, boom, they hit the ground. Then guess what? Your feet should come to where your hands are. And, and, and what we try to think of is the, the spine flexion and all that kind of stuff. We don't have that spine. We don't have that long spine to flex up. So, hmm. so we're in a position where we have to make sure that our feet can come to where our hands are. Once again, how are you going to do that? It's all, all within the calf. Yeah. It's, so I was just thinking too of that, that Olympic catch where those knees do tick in. And I, I believe it does happen in context of, like you said, like the calves twisting the feet or the toes out a little bit too. And I think that there's, you know, there's different elements that you can look at that little knees in tick. You can look at it from a pressure perspective and the gait cycle and whatnot. But I think like we've talked about when we're, when we're doing things maximally like sprinting and, and, and I guess max Olympic lifting, it's also, we really kind of get beyond the gait cycle. It's more about managing forces. Like you've said, it's like, here's the technique and now the body's going to manage it. And I, I think about that. Um, if the calf twisting the body, to create torque almost being um, also like a management tool it just as much uh if not possibly more than even the body completing the gait cycle on some of those catches where it's just like this huge pressure coming up from the ground initiated by the calves to catch receive this bar that's you know trying to crush me <laughs> it's reflexive that's right, right, where I love, you're trusting right, the brain right. to not die <laughs> i'm gonna let me right, dive right, under right. this bar and trust the brain to not die <laughs> that's one of the beautiful things about it yeah, and so if you think about which way the calves are trying to twist and you have to spin this pressure, the knees got to come in. They, they got to come in. You know, there, there's no way that you're going to twist and the knees go out. That'll ruin the whole system. It will collapse upon you. Yeah. So, you, so once accordion. again, you have, this, <laughs> you, you, you have this thing where your feet are not moving anymore, and, and so the calves have done all they can do, and as next you get, but, but that makes a natural triangle and a bridge to stand up on. And then you see the completion of it. You know, like I talk about complete circles. What do you see? You see it needs to go back to where they were. Why? Because the rotation was able to be, to be able to be finished. So really the knees coming in is the body trying to finish that rotation as you stand up. Yeah. I, so with the rotation, the pressures too, I do want to touch on this and I'd like to get to Achilles quickly, but I, I know you're not the biggest fan of doing like hinges in the weight room for the sake of like the rotation, the pressures. <laughs> like, could you explain why? Hinges are really fundamentally less. And I think we can make cases for hinges and hip rotations and functional capacities or whatever. But from a from a foot pressure and loading and compression perspective, what what's the difference between squatting and hinging? Uh, the, the the difference is when you you know being one versus two. So let's take a good morning for instance, which is a, which is a total hinge pattern. You know, uh, the feet don't care. You you know where's the weight at? The weight's out there. The feet don't care. They don't care what happens because they're not doing what? They're not actually doing anything. The, the, the upper torso or the torso is being asked to do everything that, that needs to be done. So at that point in time, where's the sensory information coming from? It's coming from that bar resting on your neck. That's where that's the sensory information. And what do you do? You pull back up on it, but the feet don't care. So if you go into a hinge pattern, once again, you cut off your legs. That's the whole problem with a hinge pattern is you cut your legs out of the picture. So now what you can do if you squat first, then hinge, that's a different loading pattern. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. I and actually, I want to follow up. But this, this light bulb, just uh, again, every time I talk to you, like a ton of light bulbs go off. But I just think the first thing you should ask in any lift is where's the information coming from. Every time I'm dealing with a barbell, an object, well, even not, but right, but but anytime I'm in the weight room, lifting, moving, working with something, where is the information coming from? And if it's just the hands or the back or the neck. Well, what kind of athlete am I going to end up being? You know what I'm saying? Like it's, it seems like it's just you're on your way to becoming this, and versus versus that. Hey, I'm going to dive under a 250 pound snatch and make my body react. Now, where's the information coming from? You know, oh, calf inside edge, twisting torque on the way up. Like that's, I think, where we see those Olympic lifters who have those immense outputs, not just in the bar, but they can run and they can jump and and all those kinds right. of things. Right. I mean, we've seen like some of the, the like I said, when you see like the, the Chinese weightlifters jump to do the box jumps, they don't put much effort into it. Why? Because they spend so much time as a class two lever. So they step class two lever, they bounce. 
because that's what they've been doing in the weightlifting. So mm-hmm. it transferred to a box jump versus you see somebody else who goes class one to class two, they can put a whole lot more effort and get up on that box. They still can get up there, but the effort changes because they got to go class one to class two, so forth and so forth. Oh, yeah. That's the story of my life. Like everything got harder the more I <laughs> lifted weights. I mean, <laughs> there were some things that got better, there were some things that got worse, you know, but right. I would say right. that the general, the gist of it was stuff did generally just get harder because I had to put more, I had to warm up more. You know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's part of getting older too. But uh, although I have found the more natural my movements are, the less I do generally have to warm up for pretty much anything. Um, right. You know, just right. go to the track. I mean, and- I mean even, think about, even think about like, a, uh, um, you know, how to catch the bar and it's on the fingers. It's on the fingers for a reason. You know, because where's that, if it's on the fingers, where's that, where's the information coming from now? So you have a different information when the bar is resting on your shoulders in a sense. Mm-hmm. But if you have your palms wrapped around that bar, where see there's a different yeah. once again it's different information so it's going to change some things you know so that so that that becomes the thing is like like you said where's the information coming from that's really important yeah it seems like it'd be hard actually to have good feet and calf action if you caught a clean um and more on the palms you know not really letting it sit on the shoulders and on the fingers but like right. like that kind of pseudo catch with the elbows down where it's just like, that's almost like a, it seems like that since that's your information now, it'd be hard to have that really reflexive, trust the body foot pressure up out of the bottom uh, reflex out of there. Yeah. But what, what, but what do they do when, when they, like I said, think about this here. If you're going to do a cleaning jerk, what changes? When they do the jerk person, what do they do? Oh, they, they adjust their hands the out. They, they have it on their shoulders and their hands scoot out. So they get ready for it. So, so see the information, where's it coming from? So that's a different, now your brain things differently and what do they do they drop out from underneath it you know what i'm saying it becomes a different thing where they drop out from underneath the bar yeah 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 oh yeah the, rather than um pushing it up are you talking about they're just setting up to kind of drop down from underneath the bar rather than so right. the information is the fingers on the bar pressing you downward into the catch right which is more athletic than palm base pushing it up <laughs> <laughs> you're not again yeah but, letting the okay, setting but, the brain up to save you basically versus versus right. trying to force something and and being kind of a not a wuss so i don't know maybe a wuss i, I don't yeah, know <laughs> <laughs> but yeah but that becomes the thing is once again but you're dead on with that the first thing you got to check is where's the information coming from and how's that affect the levers i'm about to use got it man i love that love that um oh so look, one more thing I, maybe we can save achilles for another day i think it's we don't have enough time to really do it justice but you mentioned something where it's like a squat if it's a squat to a hinge or something like that then it's okay or what what um do you explain that versus just a straight hinge that cuts you off from the, the lower body well yeah like i said if you, if you if you if you hinge first then once again where's the information coming from you know the different setup and so the brain looks at it differently Versus if you if you squat first and then hinge into it, the pressure you talking about we still about the pressure changes, you mm. know. So the pressure maybe to put into my foot changes with a squat hinge versus hinge to a squat. Yeah, that's another. Um, I did a awesome podcast with Kyle Dobbs about hingey why you know hingey back squats can hurt you from an athletic perspective, and um, uh, he gave some really good ideas from just mid stance, early stance, late stance, how that you you skip various parts of it, but. Uh, you we can add this to it is what you're saying. Like basically, you're you're down in a nice squat in the bottom, and you change when you hinge it out of the bottom of the squat, which you see all the time because people are just trying to get that weight to get stronger. Air quotes. They're changing the information source from the foot to basically the bar on your back on your neck that's pinning you. <laughs> so it's like, what's gonna, what's the brain gonna do to bail you out? It's just gonna turn your back into kind of this rigid system, and and it's, you know the foot comes depressurized, and yeah. So I guess we could add that to the the list there too. Right, right, right. Well, now too, if you look at it this way, you know, like I said, you know, hinges things are kind of funny, but look at it this way here now. Think about that same movement. If you got the weight wherever the weight's at, say the weight's at, uh, on your back. If the head tries to initiate the lift, the brain's going to fix it for you. It's a different type of hand. What do you mean? the head? If the head tries to... Are you talking about the bottom of a squat, or can you rephrase that? At, at, the, at the bottom of the squat. If the head moves first, different type of hand. If the shoulders move first, different type of hand. So so it, it, it's, just, it's just what is the brain... Where's the information coming from again? So if I'm at the bottom of the squat, the head moves first, I'm... I'm really loaded now because, you know, the head moves now, you're really loaded. 
if the shoulders move first, you unloaded the system. And so now, now once again, the feet depressurize and, and, and something else will happen. Hmm. You will still stand up, but you stand up based on straightening things out. So that's what that, and that's what we talking about, you know, success is success. And that's where, you know, people get these things mixed up at with right and wrong. No, you know, if a person's running, they're running. There is no failure at it. But what comes in with weightlifting is how does it translate? And so if you lift by straightening things out, you know, that is not going to transfer over to track and field very well because you can still run that way. And we see that all the time where, where like people go for triple extension and they straighten the leg out. Well, you're going backwards at that point in time mm-hmm. versus if you go shin and then hip over that way, you're going forward at that time. So like I said, and that's what people miss out on is how these things will trans, how they transfer becomes the issue and they will have a positive and negative influence when they transfer. It's almost like if we work in the vertical only plane and we don't let things move horizontally at all, we're kind of stuck more in class one lever, like just doing a standard calf raise. I'm just standing there moving straight legs, moving up and down. That's class right. one all day. It's I need the horizontal element of the knees going forward to actually get class two. And I think that's where we lose things too, is we just live in this vertical world and we don't appreciate the fact that, like you said, things come in pairs. We need to pair horizontals with verticals to get tendons to work and twists to happen. And it's really right, beautiful right. Thing. And that's what you see, even like with the weightlifters that jump back, that's a horizontal movement. Yeah. It's just, it's just backwards hard, see what I'm saying? So they're still in the class two mode, but they go backwards horizontal to work that class two. Yeah, no, I love that. That's just one more awesome thing for me to consider, and I'm sure everyone listening as well. But I know you got, you're busy, and you got to get out of here. And, uh, I mean, that's enough for me to digest for. That'll keep me good for another month. So <laughs> well, yeah, and that. I think, like I said, you know, a lot of people will listen to this, and, and, it's always, and think about this for a second. This is always a funny thing. A lot of people listen to this and, and will think that I'm trying to tell people how to weight lift. No, I'm not trying to tell you how to weight lift. I'm just trying to show you how to get weight lift to transfer over to the other side, you know. And always, and it's always a funny thing that even if I was trying to tell you how to weight lift, what's the problem? Because strength coach has no problem telling you how to run, so why do you have a problem me telling you how to lift? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, no, I'd much rather listen to the you telling me how to lift. Uh, I um, <laughs> so, um, you know, there's a lot of great strength coaches out there with running, but uh, you know, I, you you're awesome with movement, and so I, I really appreciate um, all these things to chew on. So I I will um, I I probably do a little bit of lifting today. It'll be a good thing to think about. I, I appreciate your time today, Darian, and and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. It's always good talking to you. All right, no problem. Thanks, Joe. That wraps up another episode. It's awesome to have you guys here, and that was a huge learning experience. So I I know that was a lot to process. It definitely was for me, and I spent a lot of time actually watching Olympic lifts and videos and slowed down versions after the show and was really trying to put it together. So if you want a little bit more, I have some uh, elements in the show notes with some examples on JustFlySports.com. So if you go to the webpage associated with this, there they are. Okay, if you enjoyed the show as well, it would really help us out if you left us a rating review on iTunes, Stitcher, uh, whatever you're, whatever you're listening to, uh, Spotify. I don't know if there are ratings on there, but if there are, that'd be cool. Um, and yeah, just a way you, you can help us out and with this show. Before we get out of here, we want to give one last shout out to our sponsor, simplyfaster.com. We've been hugely appreciative of their long-term support, so be sure to check them out and what they are doing. All right, we'll see you guys next week.